Cool. All right. Thank you all so much for coming to Transportation Transformations 2022. This is, woo, yeah. This is Seattle's, woo, TT22. This is in Seattle's annual event on the timeliest transportation topics in the Emerald City. And there's nothing more timely than uh, Seattle Department of Transportation's new director, Greg Spots, who is on day 31, I believe, <laughs> in the role, who's joining us today for a q Before I get started, I want to acknowledge our incredible hosts, Zach and Heidi with Salesforce, who are having us here today and have one of the most rock star transportation programs in the city. So let me pass it off to Zach or Heidi to share a few words and welcome us to the space. Hey, thanks everyone for coming. Zach, I think, is still downstairs bringing folks up. But um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Welcome to Salesforce and Tableau. Um, we are super appreciative of everything to meet Seattle and the partnership transit agencies and business organizations um, do to help businesses better improve um, access for employees and partner with us to help um, find more sustainable commute modes into the office. Um, also, just really grateful for all of the work that's been done in the Fremont area as far as um, better access for bikes and pedestrians. And we look forward to increased transit access at some point in the future so that we can continue to promote more bus service and, um, and getting folks uh, into the offices on buses. So we look forward to hear what's coming and, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. I need to note that Heidi's an illustrious Commute Seattle alumni, uh, and we would not be where we are today without Heidi. Me so, either. Yeah, <laughs> so thank you all for joining in the room. Thanks to everyone we have uh, here on remote. And one, I'm excited to get us all together to have this conversation, this Q&A. We'll uh, get to dive a little bit more into Drake Spot's priorities, uh, transportation in Seattle. But first, I just want to kick it off with an introduction. I'm Kirk Hovenkotter. I'm the executive director of Commute Seattle. Started this role about five months ago, and it's just been a whirlwind roller coaster to get to work with this amazing staff and get to work in the city at such an exciting time to do this work. If you don't know Commute Seattle, we are the nonprofit that works to make it easy to walk, bike, ride, and roll for the 600,000 people who come to work for school in Seattle every single day. And we do that by working with employers to help them build world-class commute programs and get things like transit passes into their hands to help them retain and recruit the best talent in the region. We work with the properties of where those businesses are located to help them build bike rooms and uh, build out daycare centers and build out facilities that make it easy to reach their buildings from across the region. And we also work with community partners to get directly to those 600,000 people who work or go to school in Seattle through events with Peace Peloton or working with South Seattle College or North Seattle College or the YMCA to really build those relationships. And one, we do this, yeah, what we do, our work is helping make Seattle a more accessible and inclusive place. And as I said, we do that by getting transit passes into people's hands helping make their work sites more accessible and make Seattle just an easier place to get around uh, for, for everyone in the region. And we do that because we're a partnership. 15 years ago, the vision, visionary leadership at the Seattle Department of Transportation, King County Metro, uh, Sound Transit, as well as the Downtown Seattle Association and the Metropolitan Improvement District, the taxing authority in downtown, saw the need for an organization that would help reduce traffic in the city and help make it easier to reach downtown Seattle from across the region. And to do that, they decided to create Commute Seattle, a one-stop shop for transportation in downtown. And this organization has evolved over the last 15 years, it's had a great illustrious alumni network, connections from uh, people of all different fields, but the focus of this organization has been to make Seattle a more thriving, uh, inclusive place and we still do that today. And the people who make that work happen are the incredible staff that we have in this room. Uh, I have to highlight Madeline, who helped uh, organize and lead this event. We have Kendall, Olivia, Zarina, Kurt, uh, Tara, Bethany, and Priya, who every day come into work talking with hundreds of businesses across the city, working with over 150 properties, 
uh, and countless uh, employees and countless commuters, people in the city, helping solve their transportation issues, really making transportation work in this city. And it wouldn't happen without their work every single day. Plus, they're a blast to work with uh, and huge transportation fans as we all got to go to the TCC gala last, uh, last weekend. But really, one, while we have Seattle in our name, our organization works across uh, the region. Uh, every day, as I've said, over 600,000 people come to work or school in Seattle, and they come here for employment, education, healthcare, for errands. And while, uh, and the people we work with are those who are most directly impacted by housing, uh, the lack of housing or expensive housing in our region. And it's something that we see every day when we're talking with commuters who need to take the bus for two hours from Algona or Pacific in South King County to get to work at a facility here in Seattle. And we see that the inequities in our transportation system really impact those people's lives directly. We know, looking at Puget Sound Regional Council data, that those who make more are more likely to be offered a transit pass by their employer than those who make less. And our work is to try and reduce those inequities and make it easier and more affordable to reach Seattle. And we reach them through those direct connections, through where they work, uh, the uh, buildings of where they work, and those direct connections with uh, the community partners and people that they trust. And it's uh, it's something where we work directly in Seattle. And we don't just work in downtown, we work across Seattle. We don't just work with large employers, we work with nonprofits, small businesses, medium-sized businesses. Uh, and we work not just on commutes, but on those trips that people take regularly on transit, biking and walking to healthcare, to education, to errands. And, uh, and this is the way that we help Seattle reach its climate goals, help make it a community where people can uh, succeed and thrive. Uh, and we're also a community organization. There's a reason why our work is not done by a consultant. There's a reason why this organization was created in the first place, to have deep ties with businesses, with people in the community, and be a nonprofit resource that can continue to evolve and grow with the city as transportation changes here and the challenges change here. And the mission that was first set out for Commute Seattle 15 years ago is not the mission that we should have today. And that is clear because Seattle is changing. Seattle is on the brink of the biggest transportation changes in its history. In the next two years, over 20 light rail stations are going to open north up to Linwood, south to Federal Way, and east into Redmond and Bellevue. We're also facing a pandemic that's changed how people get around. It showed who relies on our transportation system the most and also uh, provided a new way for people to get to work. And as we see more and more people rely on hybrid work and fall into habits of that, it, need, it relies on us to change our work. And that's critical because we see that while nearly 40% are, uh, yeah, just 40% of people are working from home, Traffic is just as bad on our freeways as it is in 2019, and traffic is all the way back up on our roads in Seattle. And so it's critical for us as an organization to change to meet these challenges. And it's something that we just see every day in our work. A lot of our work is getting transit passes into the hands of employees and employers. And we've seen just a sea change in who is looking for transit passes. Previously, tech firms were like Salesforce were the main uh, clients and customers for work business passports. Uh, in 2022, we've seen small businesses take up a, uh, just a huge chunk of nearly a fifth of our customers who are looking for work of business passport. And these are companies like Feathered Friends, Gargoyles on the Ave, Pilchuck Glass Studio, Youth Care, really foundational organizations and companies who are looking for ways to provide benefits to their employees. And that's something that we're addressing and uh, adapting to as a change in our organization and how we work. And it's something that shows that people want to provide transit. They want to provide a benefit to their employees. And we need to meet those employers and those retailers where they are. Seattle is also changing just in terms of the numbers and the need for us to go beyond the percentages. 
Comisiano's work over the last 15 years, really our goal has been to try to get three out of four people to walk, bike, take the bus, or telework. And the staff achieved that in 2017, which is a huge, huge deal. And even throughout the pandemic, those uh, mode splits have been consistent. But the question for us now is who those percentages are, who those people are. If we have still 20% of people taking transit, but their transit commutes are twice as long as those who drive in a car and they're less likely to be offered a transit pass, how do we help them and reduce those inequities and make their lives better? How do we make that central to our work? And to really get at those questions to shape our work as an organization, shape our strategic plan going forward and inform the decision makers and leaders in Seattle, we're really thrilled to be looking at the work that we do, which so much of our work is being the resource that provides data to help people make the best decisions. And for history, we've done a survey of how people get to work in downtown. And we're proud to be working with the University of Washington and Challenge Seattle and our partners at the Seattle Department of Transportation to redo that survey in a different way, uh, which we're calling the Seattle Commute Survey. That's not just looking at how people are getting into downtown, but who those people are and what's driving their behavior. And currently, the staff that we have in this room of Commute Seattle have been working tirelessly on that. And that survey has been out for all of nine days now, and we have over 21,000 respondents on that survey. This is a huge deal, and it's one of the most uh, clear looks that we have into how people get around. And it's going to be foundational into how we change as an organization, plus how Seattle needs to change. And some of the things that jump out at to us, just looking at this data with those first preliminary responses, is how Seattle is changing into a three day a week in office city. And this is something that we'll need to adapt to in how we provide transit service, how we provide uh, and design infrastructure, and how we organize uh, just our businesses as a whole. And to really adapt to what we're seeing in changing behavior, we're going to need leadership, not only from the business community, not only from folks like the Downtown Seattle Association and other institutions, but leadership from our agencies ourselves to think creatively about how we serve uh, how we serve people who come to work for school or for errands in Seattle, and how we best use the resources we have to deliver on that. Which brings me back to Seattle is a city that has been a leader that cities across the country look to over the last decade. When I worked at Transit Center, which worked across the country, we would always point to Seattle as a leader for other mayors, other transit agency board members to look to. And Seattle was the success story where transit ridership was rising while other transit, transit ridership was declining in other cities because of the decisions of leaders in the public sector and the private sector to prioritize transit, to prioritize street space for buses, to prioritize infrastructure bike lanes for bike lanes, and also create things like Orca Business Passport that provides a real tangible benefit to employees and subsidizes a major transportation cost for them. Going forward in the next 10 years for Seattle to be a leader, we need visionary leadership from those same sectors, which is why one, we're thrilled to have new leadership in great spots at the Seattle Department of Transportation, as well as leadership from within the agency. We can't do this work without great leaders like Sarah Spicer, the Transportation Options Program Manager for the Seattle Department of Transportation. So one, I want to invite Sarah up, who is our partner in the Seattle Commute Survey, in our commute trip reduction work in Seattle, and making Seattle a more accessible and inclusive place. And Sarah is going to uh, give some introductory remarks about Greg, and then we'll dive into the Q&A. So Sarah. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, just a, a quick intro, and uh, thank you um, to our hosts and to everyone attending today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Spicer, um, SDOT Transportation Options Program Manager. Um, so my staff and I manage the programs that uh, will be very familiar to most of you in the room, commuter reduction, transportation management programs, um, our commuter benefit ordinance, um, all those ways that we um, at SDOT work to, again, make uh, transportation options more accessible, more useful, um, and more well known throughout our city and our region. So I get to work uh, frequently with our wonderful team at Commute Seattle um, on those programs. 
Um, so transportation transformations, uh, as Kirk mentioned, is an annual event where we gather to review the changes to our transportation system in Seattle and regionally. And we also look ahead to what is planned for the near future. Um, so this is a great opportunity to engage with you all, hear your thoughts, concerns, um, and uh, hear from our stakeholders, which for our programs include um, a pretty wide array of uh, employer representatives, property managers, um, our peers, and our partner organizations. Um, so we really appreciate this opportunity to, to gather and reflect and also to look forward. And so in past years, we focused quite a bit, as you can imagine, on capital investment, things like a new waterfront tunnel or some new light rail stations or new bus lanes, bike lanes. And so, of course, we want to touch on that, but we also want to reflect again on some of the themes that Kirk mentioned about how the pandemic um, has changed the way we look at, um, at travel, at remote work, and at commuting, um, and the rest of our trips as well. Um, so we, uh, you know, with that in mind, um, the spirit of change is with us, and um, in celebrating change, we want to celebrate our recent change at SDOT with our new director, Greg Spots, um, whom I'm pri privileged to introduce today. Um, Greg relocated from LA to Seattle this September. Um, in Los Angeles, he recently served as executive officer and chief sustainability officer, and that was at the LA Bureau of Street Services. Um, there he worked to make LA more walkable, bikeable, transit friendly, and environmentally friendly. Um, and uh, that includes leading the delivery of, for example, over 600 million in American Recovery and Reinvestment Act project. So in his first months in Seattle, Greg is meeting with stakeholders of all kinds, whether that be staff, media, um, community advocates, um, but many other groups, such as this group, um, as part of a listening tour. And so he's here today to introduce to this community his priorities and insights as he steps into this role. So thank you, Greg, for joining us. We're, we're so psyched to have you here. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that, Sarah. Welcome to the game show side of the, uh, <laughs> of the event. So Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. First, how has the move from Los Angeles been? It's been on 10. It's just been wild. Um, I left my car in LA. I decided that I would try sort of like urban living in South Lake Union, uh, mostly using the bus. Um, I've been walking like 13,000 steps a day. And, uh, you know, I invited Seattleites to invite me to walk, bike, and ride transit in their neighborhoods. And I'm having trouble keeping up. I'm 55 <laughs> and I'm exhausted. <laughs> Like I told my staff, um, I don't want to manage this agency from like my beautiful 38th floor office in a Seattle municipal tower. I don't want to be stuck behind a PC reading emails about other staff who are emailing each other about things that we're doing. Um, I said I really want to be out in the community. Um, you know, I, I was a public servant in Los Angeles for 14 years. And I had really uh, almost an encyclopedic knowledge of the 99 different registered neighborhoods in LA. I've done projects in every single one of them. Uh, and I feel like part of my edge is that I'm sort of a boots on the ground leader. And um, it's a very steep learning curve, just like dropping into a whole new city. And so I just thought the only way to advance up that learning curve quickly is to just move about and uh, be with people uh, I mean, I'm even, you know, I'm even learning a lot just being on the bus with people or, you know, watching the city go by through the bus instead of being in nav trying to figure out where to park. Um, but people have been super welcoming. Everybody tells me um, about the Seattle freeze and they ask me, what am I going to do about it? Like really friendly people tell me about the Seattle freeze, right? And I say, um, I'm going to melt down the Seattle freeze with a little bit of California. <laughs> and recently somebody said to me, I think you're in a 99th percentile of friendliness. <laughs> and I, I said, you know, do you think I should like ratchet it down to 92? <laughs> you say keep it right up at 99? Yeah, no, it's like, it, it one, we need that energy. So oh, okay. Need, yeah, just keep it, keep it going. So, so as you shared, you moved here, you don't own a car, you were a very visible participant in A Week Without Driving. And you come to Seattle. What's really stood out to you about Seattle's transportation system compared to Los Angeles? Well, I mean, first of all, the bus system's really good. 
Um, I know there's lots of cool apps, but I've just been using Google Maps and generally the bus shows up exactly when Google Maps says it's coming. And um, I've been able to use the bus uh, or the bus and light rail together to get almost everywhere I need to go. There are certain trips where it's just way faster to like jump in a lift. Um, but I mean, the bus system is comprehensive, particularly if, you're, if your origin is origin or destination is in the downtown core. It's such a transit rich environment. Um, and also the buses are clean. The bus operators are really pleasant. Um, I mean, I really have found it to be one of the most excellent bus systems I've ever experienced. Um, so that's been um, super great. Um, I'm, all, I'm very interested in that slide you put up about the remote work and how is that going to evolve. I mean, everybody in this room, I guess we all have to be really doing some dynamic thinking and reassessing um, in a way that's very unusual. Like normally commute patterns change like by a few percentage points every year. Um, and for all of us, this is radically new territory. Um, and, and I think, you know, Seattle, DC, and San Francisco are kind of like the three top cities for remote work. Us in San Francisco, because of the tech orientation of the economy, and Washington, because there are so many federal workers. And um, trying to figure out the changing demand for, for you know, travel is going to be very critical and um, way more dynamic, I think, than anybody's ever remembered. Yeah, and one, as, as our survey goes through uh, the middle of November, happy to share more information and be on the lookout for uh, more information from us and Seattle Department of Transportation and UW on, on that survey. And we're interested in whatever you guys are hearing too, right? Like informally, uh, you know, we'd love to hear about what you're hearing from your employer, from your the, the staff that you're supporting in giving them transit. Um, that'll be really helpful too. Yeah. No, the, the nine Commute Seattle staff typically play a therapist for most employee transportation coordinators <laughs> and building transportation coordinators in the city of Seattle. Plus, when new employers are looking to come to Seattle, we're the first person they call about what's this commuter benefits ordinance? How do I support my employees when I get there? Excellent. Speaking of businesses, Seattle has this history of business being a leader on transportation. 40% of all trips taken on Metro buses are taken with an employer provided pass. We've seen many employers invest in infrastructure. On the east side, you had Meta and uh, Amazon and REI invest in the East Trail, helping physically spend millions of dollars to physically build out a trail. I'm curious, what was your relationship like with the business community in Los Angeles and what do you want to hear from the business community here? I think everything you just said is one of the things that attracted me to Seattle. Um, you know, in LA, the business community is quite fractured. Like we lost most of our Fortune 500 headquarters in the last 20 years. You know, the studios are sort of like islands unto themselves. And then, you know, healthcare is a huge uh, industry, but it's much more of a fragmented community. And, and I don't think we've seen nearly as much of that kind of leadership. So I find it um, exciting, the idea that Seattle's growing, and it's growing powered by innovation. And that innovation is happening in the private sector. And I think of myself as sort of an innovator in an innovation-stifling family of bureaucracies. Like, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I think I'm much better at that than if someone gave me, like, $100 million to start a company. You know, there's people who are better at unlimited innovation, but the innovation where it doesn't seem possible is kind of my specialty. Um, and I haven't had the potential partnerships that we have here in Seattle and in this room. So uh, I'm gonna go to the um, chamber retreat in Semiamu uh, late next week. I'm really looking forward to building some relationships there and uh, really want to approach uh, that with an open mind. Oh, you know, let me touch on something that I heard from the mayor that's relevant about this. I had dinner with the mayor in LA uh, uh, six weeks ago. He was in town for the Major League Baseball All-Star Game because that's coming here next year. And um, <laughs> is that good or bad? No, I said go, go mayor. Go <laughs> mayor. Yeah. That was brutal. Still have it. <laughs> we don't talk about it. Like, 
and, and Houston has done that to us Dodger fans many times, um, <laughs> both by cheating and by <laughs> beautiful light game hits like that. So, um, you know, uh, the, over dinner, the mayor was telling the story of how Mayor Garcetti in L.A. said, like, the, the flip side of getting the All-Star game is those like a million and a half dollars of police overtime that you have to figure out how to pay for. Like Major League Baseball was compensated for the university. And so, you know, Garcetti told Mayor Harrell that he just got the Dodgers to pay for it. So Mayor Harrell is recounting that he brought that back to um, the owner of the Mariners, who agreed to pay for it. And then Mayor Harrell said, actually, how about we get 10 business leaders to each contribute 150000 and by doing that, it can be a joint effort of the business community, and we can build capacity. And I sort of, I don't know the mayor that well, and at this point, I only really had met him in my interview and the press conference. So I blurred out, like, you're using the community organizer model for billionaires. And he goes, yeah, I am. <laughs> um, and I thought I learned something about him um, in that moment, and I'd love to be part of that. Like, are there even new and improved ways to energize the very motivated and progressive business community here, you know, for civic good? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Do you want to put in 150? <laughs> yeah, just uh, let me break out my checkbook right now. So, uh, one, on, on that note, you talked about how you're taking on major initiatives of a top-to-bottom review of Vision Zero. You're looking to make Seattle a more accessible, inclusive place. And the folks in the room here and the folks that we work with are the employee transportation coordinators who are the person in charge at their company of transportation policy, having those conversations with their employees about getting to work. We also work with building transportation coordinators who play that role in some of the largest buildings in the city. What support do you need from them or what do you want to hear from that audience to support your work? You know, the first thing that just came to mind as you were framing the question is, you know, one thing I loved about TESCOT is the transportation equity framework that's been developed. And the whole idea behind that framework is we have to bring people to the table who don't know there's a table. And instead of having like a community meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, when people are putting dinner on the table for their kids, uh, we have to go out to, to the community where they're at and invite them into the dialogue in a way that's convenient and meaningful to them. Even populations that are not plugged into the government, that don't realize that the government takes input. Um, and I'm just wondering why maybe you each can think about, in your work, is there a population of people, a subgroup of people, who don't know that they have a seat at the table? Is there a group of your workers that don't work in the office but work uh, more with their hands or on uh, other shifts? Um, is it possible that just like in our work, there's folks from an equity basis that we have to seek out? Maybe um, you guys can think that same way uh, about making sure that all of the different employees um, you know, have a voice and are heard about you know, what their transportation needs might be. That was a reverse way to answer the question instead of what can you do for me, I was yeah. asking uh, you to maybe do something for your own people. No, but as, as we play therapists for those employee transportation coordinators, they're doing that for their employees. They have all these stories. And I think that's a great point is how do we amplify these stories and how do we bring the experiences that people have and face every day that <clears throat> determines whether or not they stay in that job or whether they can stay in their neighborhood. I mentioned, by the way, that like uh, I was at uh, the public transit conference yesterday. And something that I was really just delighted to share with our peers from around the country is not only does the city of Seattle uh, you know, work very collaboratively with the transit agencies, but we actually have a city revenue stream where we're funding, we're buying transit trips. And what we've decided to do recently, uh, you know, in the last few years during the pandemic, is to mostly buy off-peak trips. Um, and it's even more interesting now, like there's a bus operator shortage. So there's, in a world of fewer trips, we're holding some steady or increasing them. And we're doing that outside the morning and PM peak. And we're hoping that that's helping shift workers uh, who don't have a regular, uh, you know, 95 uh, public housing residents, um, 
the elderly, and some other key groups. So, you know, we're actually putting city tax dollars into trying to make the system not just a one size fits all. No, and the Seattle Transit Benefit District, which is that funding source, it was when it was voted on in 2020, got 80% of the vote in Seattle. There's very few other things you can get 80% of Seattleites to agree on, but transit is the thing they do agree on. And it's a model that when I was at Transit Center, I'd celebrate to cities and mayors across the country of Seattle's putting its money where its mouth is and just behind more bus service hours. Uh, but I think to the slide that I showed, we have an opportunity to say, how do we reallocate hours, potentially service bus service hours from those Mondays and Friday peak to the times when people need them the most and the neighborhoods that need them the most and get them to other jobs, potentially outside the downtown core and elsewhere. Yeah, or even non non work related trips too. I know that's what that's the game you guys are all in, but it's really interesting to think like, can transit be part of the fifteen minute city? You know, can we make transit a way that you could get to a medical appointment um, or you know, or to entertainment or other things? Um, one really great success of um, the light rail is, you know, how it's used for the stadiums. I mean, when you get on, on, on a, actually, and, and also for um, the college games that you dub also. Like, whether it's a Saturday or Sunday, you can get on and see everybody all geared up uh, going to the game, and that's reducing a lot of carbon emissions. But it's interesting to think of, like, outside the, like, core backbone, are there lots of other types of trips we can enable if we provide the right service and build, like, a sort of culture where people feel comfortable Absolutely. I mean, I'm taking the bus to Green Lake. By the way, um, when you were introducing yourself, I just wanted to mention that you said more bus service. You have the best bus in the city that comes right here. So, You're the king of the 62 right here. Yes! Do you know this about me? So, okay. So, like, Green Lake is my happy place. And the 62 is the bus that takes you from South Lake Union to Green Lake. So, I'm trying to get to Green Lake every weekend. A, I have a project going on there that I'm visiting. It's construction, the, the loop around the west uh, side. Great project. And then it is a great project. And then um, you should see the terrible NIMBY emails I get about <laughs> what an awful project it is. Um, but anyway, uh, I use it to get there for work and for fun. And I was going to like meet some friends at this soul food restaurant called the June Baby uh, on in Ravenna, and um, I was I was there early, so I stopped. There's a, a bookstore that has a coffee place upstairs and a little pub downstairs there. Yeah, so I went into that little pub, and I was chatting with the bartender. Yeah, I'm new to town. I, I moved here from LA. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm in the government. What do you do in the government? Oh, I'm in transportation. Oh, what a transportation. <laughs> oh, I'm the S-Dot director. Oh! <laughs> and he goes, the 62 is the best bus in the system. <laughs> and then he takes the little, you know, that little pad where there are like two cheeseburgers and fries that makes a ticket for you. He makes me a regional transit map of the desired transit for the entire Puget Sound region on this little ticket. And then I'm like, this is tweet where he, you know, can I have it? And he goes, no, I'm a terrible artist. So I've been telling this story about, uh, as to illustrate the passion of Seattleites for transportation, like never in LA would a bartender tell me what was the best bus in the system. We're a town of 600,000 transit planners. It's, it's <laughs> but I've think, heard from almost all of them already. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, and I think to your point that one, we can, if transit doesn't work for every aspect of your commute, whether that's getting your child to daycare on the way into work or getting to a medical appointment before you go into work, you're not gonna take it for any aspect of your commute. So, I mean, that's really our focus is how do we make e-bikes, bikes, transit, carpooling, van pooling work for all of those trips, not just this point-to-point -point trip that has been the traditional idea of a commute. So you've heard enough of my voice. Uh, let me open it up to the room to see if we have any questions for Greg. Uh, yeah, I knew he was going to ask me. Oh my god. And can you say name, organization? Uh, my name's Elliot. I'm a Salesforce employee, so I decided to drop by. Very convenient for yeah, you. Yeah, so yes. not part of any kind of organization. Uh, I want to first call out my least favorite intersection of the city is, because it's local, is directly south of Fremont Bridge. That one's miserable. Um, me and my one-year-old bike around, and that one's always like the worst part of our trip, going anywhere. And it's so critical because it connects so many parts, the downtown trail, 
divert Gilman to Ellie Bay Trail. So, please fix. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious. I understand. I think all of us understand like the external challenges of money and time and those kind of things. But I was hoping you could speak about kind of internal challenges when Dirk had elected Sam Zimbabwe as your predecessor. I think you had a lot of good ideas, but then I was kind of disappointed that even though things had budget, they had approval, they didn't seem to get done. Of course, it had, had the pandemic and all that, but like what kind of internal government bureaucracy challenges do you anticipate having, or maybe once you had in LA, it would be very helpful. Right, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I uh, My favorite book about the public sector is a book called Instruction to Deliver by Sir Michael Barber who ran the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit for Tony Blair. And the book is all about how you can have a sort of performance management group that drives delivery of what's been promised uh, to make sure that you're getting the outcomes that, you know, that are on time and on budget and are actually driving the true outcome. Uh, so I was Mayor Viragos's um, performance management lead uh, in 2009, 10, and 11. Uh, and then uh, I was... I, I kind of untangled some capital projects and uh, ended up with an $11 billion portfolio of mega projects, transportation mega projects that I was the city's lead on. So I have a lot of expertise in uh, unlocking the ability of bureaucracies to deliver large and complex projects. And I intend um, you know, to bring that uh, to this role uh, you know, in many ways. ESCOT has many different facets, but a lot of it is delivering large complex projects and they're big i mean the madison street you know rapid ride g project is a more than 100 million dollar project um, so i'm going to be very interested in you know, working closely with the staff on how we can uh, you know streamline the system for design and construction and delivery of these projects uh, both to make it uh, more cost effective and uh, more Do we have any employee transportation coordinators in the room with us today who have a question? Yeah, we need at least three of you guys to raise your hand. Don't be shy. Not ETC. <laughs> <laughs> Are they very quiet? Is ETC? <laughs> do we have to offer a reward? What do we have to do for them? Uh, I was just wondering if there were any particularly innovative or exciting projects that you oversaw in LA that you think translate well or would, would kind of fit with things that you try to achieve. Yeah, that's a great question, and I can't help in this early stage of like comparing and contrasting. And there's like things Seattle has like some very sophisticated and attractive like stormwater uh, best practices in the street. That you know, when I came here in 2019, I was like, you know, why can't we have these nice things in LA? You know, this is this rain garden is so beautiful. <laughs> um, but then there's other things where LA's ahead. You know. Um, two of them that I can think of off the top of my head, you know, in L.A., uh, I won an award with a group of people for putting tablets out in the field so that, you know, folks who fix potholes and, and respond to tree emergencies have real-time view of the service requests. And we don't have that in Seattle. And we don't have a means where people in the fields can close out service requests either. Like, all the service request system really does is generate a whole bunch of emails to people about what customers want. It's not an end-to-end -end paperless digital workflow, and I'm, I have some expertise in that. I'd love to try to help Seattle with that. Uh, I've also done a lot of work in um, reducing the carbon emission and air pollution of municipal fleets, um, and Seattle um, isn't where LA is on that. Uh, some of that has to do with California has a lot of great policy supports for things like uh, plug-in vehicles, uh, drop-in renewable fuels, uh, CNG instead of diesel, etc. Uh, and uh, Washington State is just starting to bring on some of those policy supports. But I think that if you think about it, like residents pay taxes to buy diesel trucks that equitably distribute particulate matter to everybody in the city as we're delivering city services. And I'd really like to untangle that and try to figure out how those services could be delivered with less pollution and less carbon emissions. And I think I may be able to bring some things uh, into the mix that uh, hasn't been there. Did I lose you guys at heavy trucks? That's not like <laughs> yeah. commuting. I'm not a business owner. I'm a condo owner. Can I ask 
for uh, Corey Dew. I live at Waterfront Landings, and we had corresponded prior about uh, the protected bike lane that's going in in front of my condominium. But that aside, <laughs> um, there are two con uh, constituencies that I'd just like to put into your imagination since I'm here. I'm a retired person, and living right by the Seattle Aquarium, where a number of elevators have been shut down. And you're right, the bus service on Third Avenue is fabulous. For me to get to it now, I have to walk half, half a mile out of my way. Uh, I am, um, I do not own a car, I'm committed to public transportation, and I would walk a mile rather than buy a car, but anything you can do about that. Because it, it is a transportation desert where I am, down on the last big way, and there are plenty of employers down there with the cruise ships and so on and so forth. I don't even know what all of them would be, but there's people that are parking in garages to get there, <laughs> and uh, that might be an area. The other constituency I'd like you to keep in mind is the homeless uh, and how transportation can benefit them. So I think Mark Jones ought to be at the table for a lot of this type of discussion to see whether there's a way to facilitate uh, the homeless getting back into the mainstream with the rest of us and employ the people to have in our side. Mark, Thank you. Mark Jones, the head of the Regional Homeless Authority. Uh, yes, Sabrina. Hey. Hey. Hi, I'm Sabrina Bell Marina, and we're a place properties, a uh, small property owner in downtown Seattle, and serve on various boards and associations and work really closely with DSA and Kate Seattle. Um, a few years ago, I co chaired the DSA Third Avenue vision, and that was something that recently um, has city support now, so I'm very excited about that. But I was wondering um, if it sounds like um, SDOT's going to be a big team in that project, and if there's anything you can share with the group on progress or what you're looking forward to or what we can expect with pushing that vision forward that we have. Sure, yeah, it's very, you know, early stages, um, but, you know, I'm kind of a student of um, cities and how they work, and I'm interested in every aspect of them, not just how you get to and from places. And I think the vitality of downtown is an absolutely critical, um, you know, risk and opportunity uh, currently for city government. And I think it needs to be uh, taken with great seriousness and urgency at this moment. I think there's a lot of great assets in downtown, but you can feel um, where some of the risks are you know, right now, post pandemic. Uh, and, you know, in addition to third, I'm really interested in first and this sort of like missing streetcar segment and how, you know, building the, the, the third part of the streetcar might be catalytic uh, for the downtown. So I'm, I, I think I'm hoping to be like a thought partner with lots of other uh, folks in the city government on sort of a I mean, all in strat a whole of government strategy for downtown's vitalization, not just uh, figuring out third, which is an, an easy problem to figure out in itself, but just generally like how if the you know that office population is going to be significantly decreased in some ongoing basis, how do we refresh and renew all the reasons you know for people to come downtown? And I, I think it's we can't possibly fail if we have to figure out how to succeed. I walked third with Chief Diaz last week. Um, I asked him to take me out there. I've been out there many times myself, but I thought I'd like to hear from him about the public safety challenges um, and see it through his eyes. Um, and it was very uh, enlightening and, and also worrisome. Uh, so yeah, there's some, you know, there's a lot, a lot to do uh, both on third and generally uh, for the downtown. And I'm hoping SDOT can really lean in and be an excellent partner to all the other agencies that we're working on. Well, we're excited to have you at the next Downtown Transportation Alliance that we host. So uh, excited to see you there in the eight. Yeah. All right, Madeline. We've got a question from the chat. Um, currently, there's a wave of traffic violence in the south side of the city, Rainier Valley and Soto in particular. 
Historically, these areas have not received the same levels of investment as others. Can you, Greg, speak to how equity will be incorporated in project selection and delivery? Yeah, I mean, definitely the entire SDOT staff is passionate about investing in South Seattle. That train left the station long before I got here. I, I didn't have to organize some sort of pivot to that. Everyone's really acutely aware of the need for that. In some of my walking and biking tours um, of that area, or those many communities that comprise South Seattle, you know, a lot of what's been brought forward to me is that because it's so hilly, the flat routes have been, uh, you know, oriented towards cars. You know, MLK, Rainier, um, the Lake Washington Boulevard. And, um, and then everybody who's walking and biking is pushed off of those couple of, you know, valleys or ravines and up into hilly terrain. That takes a lot of effort. So that's a very interesting um, dynamic about it. You know, um, uh, I, you know, in my in asking folks to invite me for a ride, one of the people who took me up on it is council member Tammy Morales, and she rode me into submission on her e-bike. <laughs> um, I mean, like, I asked the day before, like, can I get just a map of, like, where we're going to go, you know? And, um, and this map is, like, com complete circle around her entire district. Like, this is not a neighborhood bike ride. This is what my morning was like that day. I don't have any bikes here because since I didn't bring my car, my bikes would have been brought up by the car. So my bikes are coming when my furniture comes. So when I, when I go on these bikes, I have to use like a line bike. And so I'm trying to reserve a line bike. You know, what's the name of that place? Hellman City, yeah. where we're meeting. And, and I guess because I have a membership, I can reserve it for 30 minutes instead of 10. So I do that from South Lake Union at like 7.15 in the morning. And then I like get in a lift and the guy's like very leisurely getting on the freeway. And I said, don't break any laws, but I got 23 minutes to get to this line bike, you know, it's, <laughs> or I'm going to lose it because it's the only fully charged line bike, you know, in the entire, like, you know, uh, part of her district. And then we rode around for two hours. And it's interesting. There's a lot of really nice trails, but often the connection points between each segment of the trail are not super safe feeling or carefully organized. Um, so, you know, we're just going to have an all out effort on safety. And the reason why I commissioned a, a 90 day top to bottom review of Vision Zero is before reallocating uh, funding or staff time and effort, I wanted to really have a full analysis of uh, what might not have been working in the past in our investments. So uh, we'll be reporting back on that, you know, early next year. and. Um, and a big part of the focus will be, you know, in South Seattle. Right. I think we have time for two more questions before we wrap up. So, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Hoover from Dio, uh, Seattle's other uh, permitted bike chair operator. Um, and um, I'm using your sit down scooter. That's awesome. I'm scared of the stand up one, but the sit, <laughs> sit down one is super cool. It's great. And I'm and happy to hear you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I thought you, Tammy would think that was wimping out. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is a bike. It has pedals. It can operate independently of the throttle. Um, my question is to, to kind of pivot back to the, you know, employer, you know, employer transportation orientation of the conversation. What is your vision for micro mobility providers to fit into that piece? Do you see it as like it's effectively our responsibility to make those kind of B2B partnerships and fit into the Orca and token transit kind of ecosystem to a lot of payments? Or do you have, does SDOT have sort of a broader vision of, you know, kind of foot, you know, seating micromobility as like an equal kind of part of the ecosystem at the table with transit, with walking, with person and bikes? That sort of thing? That's a totally wonderful question. And I'd really like to engage more deeply on that. Um, you know, I, a complexity for cities when because I watched, you know, as a Santa Monica resident, I watched when Bird first launched and I've, I've been through the whole thing. I helped with uh, develop the permitting system for LA for micro mobility, which was a very different way to organize it than Santa Monica. So I've been thinking about this for years and there were times when I was like obsessively checking this online map to see where the scooters were in LA that day. Um, 
And you know, something that like city DOTs still don't understand is what's the balance between like tourism and fun on these shared devices and them actually becoming supplementary to the backbone of transportation. I think that second part is maybe more interesting than just the tourism and, and joy riding. Um, and I think it's not well understood. And I would love to be part of, you know, convening the right people together um, to think through that um, and figure out where are the best, you know, routes or connections where, um, you know, a, a great way to enable a commute that otherwise doesn't work is to have a leg of it be on micro mobility. Is that a fair answer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, since I have the last also not an ETC. Um, I think it's a little early maybe for you to answer um, what the most important priorities are for you in the next couple of years, but I would really like to hear what topics or issues or modes make you truly happy and excited when you think about working on them. Maybe like the top three things that you can already tell you're really going to enjoy tackling here at Seattle. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, I'll try like a couple different approaches to that great question. So I told the staff this summer, you know, I'm publicly committing to a top to bottom review of Vision Zero because I felt it was obvious that the, the outcome, the reduced killed and seriously injured was going in the wrong direction. I committed to strengthening our asset management approach to the, maintaining the bridges, particularly the movable bridges like the Fremont Bridge right here, and to doing this listening. So I didn't want to kind of parachute in and establish some priorities before I understood what was going on, but I did have a pretty clear understanding from a variety of stakeholders that the safety and the, and the bridge component of the safety would be worth advancing while I was doing the listening tour. You know, one of the things that, of all the places, I mean, I love to walk and bike. Um, they do give me joy for sure. But one of the places that excited me the most as I've seen SDOT's work is this Rapid Ride G project on Madison. And you look at this project where you're replacing a 100-year-old water main on a diagonal street. And then you're going to make that diagonal street your corridor for you know, <coughs> bus walking and biking. And there's these five-way intersections because it's diagonal. And the project enables you to reconfigure each one of those major intersections to be safer for pedestrians and cyclists. And then you get like a full BRT, bus rapid transit implementation with center bus boarding islands. But the BRT became this actual like catalyst for a total rethink and refresh of a hundred year old infrastructure. That sounds like a layers and layers of wins to me, you know? And you're getting, you know, a whole lot of federal money to do it, right? Tens of millions of federal money. So, um, you know, uh, that leads me to tell you I'm pretty darn excited about Rapid Ride J. You know, uh, there are some people who aren't crazy about that project, but I do see these corridor projects as being able to actually improve the corridor for all users, organize all users in a safer and more pleasant way. And I do think that economic development will follow uh, those type of projects. I think it's obvious that investment will come as you um, do that type of corridor refresh. So that really excites me too. Now, a few things that have to work, right? We have to like, you know, finish the levy strong and get the voters to pass another transportation funding measure. That's essential. Um, we have to get right the station location and the station design, station area design for the light rail extension. Like that's absolutely critical. Um, and then, you know, in some ways, a lot of the other stuff can happen if I can make SDOT a truly great place to work that attracts, develops, and retains the best talent. Um, I'm not just a thought leader, I'm an administrator, and I have to figure out how to administer this 1,300 person agency and build a leadership and management structure that uh, people feel great working in. Uh, I do feel like the, this is really terrific talent at SDOT and it's just up to me to shape how everybody works together. But I do think like that if I can improve the organizational health, 
all the outcomes and deliverables can improve as well. So um, I'm overflowing with enthusiasm for this uh, multifaceted journey. Uh, and I want to stay, you know, in touch with all of you along the way. I think that's a great note to end on. And I hope you continue to bring that California sunshine to everything that you're doing here. We need it. Uh, one great, thank you so much for your time. And hopefully you can stick around a little bit for our networking with the incredible Cafe Turco that is catered downstairs to continue this conversation. Oh, great. Yeah. But Are you one... overflowing with enthusiasm too? Always. Well, <laughs> no, just, I like it. My first time you've been So thank you so much, Director Spots, for joining us. I also want to take this moment to acknowledge uh, Salesforce for hosting us here. Uh, let me, before, before I pass it off to Heidi, I need to first just say, one, please continue to follow our work at Commute Seattle. You can learn more about everything this incredible team does at commuteseattle.com, following us on social media. Also reach out at info at commuteseattle.com and Hang out with me. I'll give you my business card. You can have my, have my phone number. Text me anytime. <laughs> but I do want to take one moment to just acknowledge, first, the incredible work of Madeline Feig, our communications lead, for making this event happen. Wanna... Also, thank Zarina for helping spark this conversation and organize this. I want to thank our partners at SDOT, Sarah Spicer, and Anne for making this happen. And also, I want to take one moment to acknowledge that this is the last week for Commute Seattle's program director, Olivia Holden. This, org this organization wouldn't be what it is today without Olivia. Olivia's worked at Commute Seattle for four and a half years, and the city of Vancouver, Washington, is, just doesn't know how lucky it is to have Olivia leading their transportation demand management program down there. So one, I want to acknowledge... So one, while you're eating delicious hummus, you should talk to Greg, but also you should congratulate Olivia over there. So on that note, let me pass it over to our great hosts, Heidi and Zach at Salesforce. Yeah, I just want to give you a few logistics. Lunch should be set up on the counter right outside, so you can just grab food. There's drinks in the kitchen, and then we'll eat back in here. Um, and then if anybody's taking off right away, I can escort you back down the stairs or the elevator to do that now, or whenever you're ready, just let me know, and you'll turn in your badge. And then, oh, and I wanted to thank our government affairs team for hosting lunch because they donated lunch for us. Thank you. Thank you.